Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us as we release the Generations United 2020 State of the Grand Families Report. Facing a pandemic, families living together during COVID-19 and thriving beyond. I'm Karen Jones, I'm President and CEO of the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging, and I'm a proud Generations United board member. As we begin today's event, we invite those of you on social media to join and to tweet along uh, with us by using the hashtag GrandFamilies2020. That's GrandFamilies2020. This year's State of the Grand Families report was made possible by the generosity of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Casey Family Programs. We are grateful for their support and their commitment to supporting families and ensuring safe and stable homes for all children. Grand families or kinship families are families where grandparents or other relatives or close family friends are raising children. This is the perfect time to release our new report September is Kinship Month, and earlier this month, we will celebrate Grandparents' Day. In recognition, resolutions have been introduced by both the House and the Senate, recognizing the critical role of grandparents and other relatives raising children, and the Senate is expected to pass the resolution, hopefully sometime this week. Now it is my great honor to present Generations United 2020 Grand Families Champion Award to Senator Sherrod Brown, Sherrod Brown of Ohio, who has been an outspoken advocate for grand families across the country, many of whom are joining us for this event from their homes today. Senator Brown has repeatedly demonstrated his long-standing dedication to children and other adults and, an, and is an important advocate for grand families. Families like Melody James, a grandparent caregiver from Ohio who explains our grand families are hurting. Many are struggling with their own mental health challenges while trying to help their grandchildren. All of this is exacerbated by this pandemic. Services that were available to grandchildren while in school are no longer available and grandparents are struggling with the reality of a new role as a homeschooler. Senator Brown has responded to the impact of the pandemic on these families by leading the introduction of the Child Welfare Emergency Assistance Act, which provides emergency investments in kinship navigators, programs that connect grand families to critical supports and benefits and services in the community. The act would also provide dollars to help grand families with emergency needs like transportation, housing, and utility payments. He is a co-sponsor of the Grand Families Act and fought for strong kinship provisions in the Family First Prevention Services Act. Senator Brown's commitment and leadership have been and will continue to be critical for improving the lives of grand families across the country, especially now during this devastating COVID-19 pandemic. For all of these reasons, and on behalf of the board and staff of Generations United, I am delighted to present the 2020 Grand Families Champion Award to Senator Sherrod Brown. Mm -hmm. Senator Brown had planned to join us today, but unfortunately, things are a little busy right now in Washington and he had to be pulled away. <laughs> did send this video though to accept the award. Oh. 
I'm Sheriff Brown. It's an honor to serve so many of you in the United States Senate. Thank you to Generations United for honoring me today with the Grand Families Champion Award. But more importantly, thank you for the work you do every single day. I've worked with Generations United for years. I know you play a key role in supporting families in all the forms that we take as families, bridging the gap between generations to create stronger families and better and stronger communities. Your advocacy helps us make progress as we work together to support kinship families and child welfare agencies and to expand access to affordable quality child care and early childhood education. This pandemic has been in so many ways the great revealer laying bare the strains so many families are under or under long before this pandemic has revealed racial disparities and resource disparities and the flaws in many of our institutions. Each year we recognize September as Kinship Care Month, but caregivers don't exactly take the other 11 months out of the year off. They need help now. That's why I worked with you to introduce the Child Welfare Emergency Assistance Act to get emergency assistance to kinship caregivers in kinship navigator programs during this pandemic and beyond. To get it passed, we need your advocacy, we need your voices. Kids in foster care, kids who have lost their caregivers to COVID-19 or whose parents struggle with addiction. They don't have a super PAC, they don't have high priced lobbyists, but they have you telling your stories, telling their stories, and that is so important. Whether you're raising children yourselves or whether you're working with families, you all advocate for these kids who have no other voice in our government. Think about that. Other than you and the stories you tell these children so often have no other voice in our government. I'll continue working in Congress to support kinship families so that all generations, those that built this country, we know they did, those that will build this country in the future, and we know they will. So they're all stronger for years to come. I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you again for everything that you do for the next generation that you do for our communities that you do for our country. I'm grateful. Thank you, Senator Brown, for your work on behalf of grand families. Today, Generations United is releasing our seventh annual State of Grand Families report. This year's report shines a spotlight on the incredible contribution grandparents and other relatives play in raising our, children's, our country's children and the increased difficulties they face, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. To share with you the report, key findings and recommendations, I'm pleased to introduce the report's primary author, Anna Beltran. Anna has been an invaluable member of the Generations United team for more than 20 years, originally serving as the first director of our National Center on Grand Families, and now serving as the center's special advisor, anchoring our Seattle office. Before I turn to Anna, I want to mention that we will have time for questions at the end of the program. If you have any questions at any time during the program, please submit them using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Anna, I turn the program over to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Karen. <clears throat> it's my privilege to be with all of you today and to work for, have worked for Generations United and its National Center on Grand Families for as long as I have. My grandmother raised me in part, which is what led me to do what I do. Um, there's not a day that I don't that I don't think about her. Sorry, there was some feedback, um, and how she handled whatever life throws my way. As a public health nurse, I know she had a lot of wise words to say about this pandemic, and she definitely be nagging me to wash my hands. Uh, so I honor all the caregivers at the event today, and thank you for all you do. And know that it's never going to be forgotten by those who love you the most. She died. 30 plus years ago, and I think about it every day. Again, this year, our report was informed and inspired by men and women like my family, our national network of caregiver advocates known as Grand Voices. You'll hear from two of them later in the program. 
So the COVID-19 pandemic has caused unprecedented challenges, as we all know, for all families. But the unique circumstances of grand families have caused them to be impacted more than most. Older adults are being told to keep their distance from children. That's not possible for the two million grandparents who are raising their grandchildren. Grandparents like Ms. Betty Hox, Hoxie, Mr. Joe O'Leary, and the Hannah family, who share their experiences in this report. They're making meals, changing diapers, helping with all that virtual learning. They can't just wave through windows or video chat like other older adults. These are the children's first front line of defense in this public health emergency. Now in the next slide, you'll see that the numbers of children and grand families are increasing. There are more children in multi-generational households, that $8 million, um, eight million I was gonna say dollar, no, eight million number has increased. There are 2.7 million about children in the care of grandparents and other relatives and close family friends without parents in the home. And although that, that last little number has decreased, um, it's the same percentage of the foster care system. So about 32% of all children in foster care are placed with relatives. So that system really relies on relatives more than ever with an eight percentage point increase over the last decade. But none of this data reflects the many new grand families who have formed because parents died of COVID-19. Parents like Missy Ashley Hanna, who's profiled in this report, who was working hard at the local Cracker Barrel restaurant, and she's paying, she was paying for expenses in the home that she shared with her parents and her three young boys. But this healthy young woman died due to the virus, leaving the boys in the care of her parents. And this dad doesn't reflect her or others like her. In addition to COVID-19, many factors cause grand families to form, as you'll see on the next slide. Parental substance use is a common one, incarceration, detainment, deportation, many factors. And because these things can happen to just about anybody, we see grand families spanning the racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic spectrums. We know from the data that the majority of these, um, uh, if you go back to the last slide, we know from the data that uh, the majority of grandparents uh, of children who are in the care of their grandparents are white and that there are many Latino children, Latinx children in the care of relatives as well, about a quarter, 24%. But both of those populations, uh, their numbers are mirrored in the general population of children. It's different for black and Native American children as you'll see on the next slide. They are more likely to live in kinship care both inside the foster care system and outside the foster care system. So on the next slide, you'll see that many of the grand families are over age 60. It's that last little square, the last little circle. So over 48% are age 60 and over, and over 25, about 25% have a disability. That compares to 6% of parents of children. So these families <clears throat> are more likely to be black, more likely to be native, more likely to have a disability, and more likely to be 60 and over. So all of these factors, as you'll see on the next slide, put these caregivers at a greater risk for COVID-19. Black parents like Ashley Hanna are more at risk of dying from COVID-19 and leaving the care of children to their parents. When parents can't raise them, decades of research tells us that children thrive with their grandparents and other kin. You'll see that on the next slide. These children have more stability, better mental health and behavioral outcomes. They're safer, they stay connected with their brothers and sisters, and they just plain feel loved, like I did. Caregivers also tell us it's that love that motivates them. Ms. Betty Hoxie shares in the report, quote, keeping family together and maintaining these connections is the best part of kinship care, unquote. So as a society, we want the children with relatives, but these families also have challenges challenges that are all heightened by the pandemic. For the first time today, we're pleased to share the results from a new nationwide survey of 600 caregivers raising 1,200 children. This was conducted by our partners at Grand Families Outcome Work Group, known as GROW, and Collaborative Solutions. Straight from the caregivers, we're hearing the heightened challenges these families face include legal authority, 
the vast majority of kin caregivers don't have a legal relationship to the children that they're raising. They, they haven't adopted, they don't have guardianship or legal custody, sometimes not even a power of attorney. And trying to develop a caregiving plan for those children if they should die is really difficult, if not impossible. And the survey tells us that at least 30% of these caregivers do not have a plan for those children if they should die or because of the pandemic or any other reason. Because unlike parents, they don't have an automatic legal relationship to the children. And they can't just name a guardian in their will like I did. Can caregivers plan is more complex, as is their access to services and supports. You'll see on this slide that 38% told us that they're unable to pay or they're worried about paying their mortgage or rent. 43% fear leaving their home for food. 32% get to food pickup sites only to discover that there's no more food. Anecdotally, we also know from Grand Voice Mercedes Bristol and so many others that the pandemic and its online, <clears throat> its resulting online learning, quote, has been very difficult for children with learning disabilities and for kin caregivers who have limited knowledge of technology and the different platforms that are, law, that are being used in schools. This has caused many breakdowns with the grand families, end of quote. We've heard that from so many. So what can help? Well, caregivers tell us that online support groups are very helpful. Pediatricians, their own primary care physicians, friends, and kinship navigator programs are really helpful. You'll hear from one such fabulous kinship navigator program later in the program, Ms. Ali Caliendo Foster Kinship in Nevada. So lessons learned during this public health emergency can help us build more equitable systems of support. Systems that support children, regardless of who's raising them and don't penalize them because their parents can't raise them. We're seeing the, government the federal government show flexibility with program rules and restrictions. We're seeing more and more meaningful engagement of kinship caregivers, foster youth, foster parents, birth parents in system reform. And we're also seeing robust kinship navigator programs connect caregivers and children to services and supports that they need. So how can we continue these advances and help build more responsive systems of support for kinship families? Well, the report ends with key policy, federal policy recommendations and local practice uh, recommendations. The federal policy recommendations really do center around the principle of financial equity. Uh, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, children with relatives have just not been supported equitably. Children in foster care with relatives who are in the legal custody of the foster care system typically do not get the same support that they would get if they were being raised by a stranger. Those outside the system with kin often get no financial support at all. So these recommendations listed here, and they're more in the report, are really meant to address finally those inequities. On the next slide, you'll see some practice, some local practice recommendations which kind of build on what we've already talked about. The authentically engaging all those with lived experiences is really critical. The coordination of the federal and state and local and tribal COVID responses to really make sure that they're including grand families. Those, kin those robust kinship navigator programs are critical. And even something as simple as just using inclusive language and images in outreach materials can move the needle. So not gearing all the materials towards parents, but talking about caregivers, that alone can help. So please consider this State of Grand Families Report and the six that preceded it as a call to action and an educational tool. So it's my privilege now to turn it over to Ms. Gail Engel. Gail is a member of Grand Voices, Grand Voices, wait, that's repetitive. Gail is a member of Generations <laughs> United Grand Voices Network. And she's also the executive director of Grand Family Coalition in Colorado. And she's joining us today to share her grand family story during COVID-19. Thank you, Gail. Thank you all. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Senator Brown, for the support that you have given us. Um, my husband and I are raising our grandchild who is now 13 years old. He has um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, autism, sensory issues, and many more things. We adopted him five years ago. 
but our journey was not easy. We tried to get help for his mother through the child welfare system, but it went nowhere. Mental health is an issue that needs attention. She turned to alcohol because she couldn't hear, because she couldn't get the resources she needed to get to keep her child and she lost it. The Family First Prevention Service Act is not the only answer here. We tried to get help for, for us through the child welfare system. If we could have received help, we would have received a kinship foster stipend, an assist assessment for his disabilities, financial assistance to support his, his needs, adoption subsidy and assistance for adoption expenses, federal adoption assistance for adopting a child with a disability, and Medicaid, but we got none of those things. We did not qualify because he was already safe with us. Taking on a child at 51 didn't seem impossible. It wouldn't have been a choice I would have made any other way, but it didn't make life easy. Now that I am retired, my husband, we, he doesn't even see the end of, end of his work life because it's our income that we rely on. Our health is a challenge. Our income is a challenge. Our disabilities are a challenge. I run a nonprofit organization here in Colorado offering peer support for kinship families and advocate at the federal state level for the over 2.7 million children and the families that take care of them like mine. When COVID hit in March, school went to remote learning. Here in Colorado, schools have gone to either online learning or remote learning. Any child that cannot self-motivate or are encouraged not to do online learning, but to do the remote learning through their school teachers at school. Restre receiving instructions for their teachers. In October, in October, they will return back to school two days a week, alternating between two different groups. Having a child with special needs is a challenge. Children won't, um, children won't get their needs met through remote learning. Our child returned to school two weeks ago, five days a week in an effective needs class, which has been really helpful. And today he's home because there is an outbreak in his class. So I'm back to being that person again. I became not only the parent that worked from home, but also the special needs teacher, the math teacher, the lunch lady, the school counselor, therapist, school nurse, and even the school bus driver. To say the least, our relationship has been a real challenge having this little boy at home. Many of our families are also caring for their, grand, for their older adults' parents in their home, which makes it even harder. Our fear is older adults, and it, and it is a real fear. My husband has COPD. I have many health issues. Returning our child to school will expose us, and that's a real fear for us. If I die, what will happen to him? Who will care for him? The schools, they offer free and reduced lunch programs, which is really great, and they're offering it to all families. But the four mile trip, round trip that I have to get every day to pick up that lunch just added to my challenge. And so I opted not to, to take it. Parent visitations with his mother are very challenging because I am afraid of the exposure. I also co-parent with my granddaughter, with my daughter, but I haven't been able to see her either. The fear is real. The mental hardship on all of us is real. The anxiety is real. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Gail, for sharing your story. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce you to Ali Caliendo, the Executive Director of Foster Kinship, which is a nonprofit located in Nevada, and it's profiled um, in this year's report. Ali? Hi, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're listening from. Um, 
Thank you so much, Gail, for sharing your story. I'm very emotional um, because what foster kinship does is support families like Gail. And if you take Gail, her grandchild, and their story and multiply it by 30,000, you have the number of um, children in kinship care in our state, Nevada, that foster kinship serves. So we run the statewide navigator program. We're a nonprofit organization working to make sure that every family like Gail's is safe stable and providing nurturing care for the children in their homes. Um, and it's stories like Gail that not just break my heart because um, you want the same outcomes for all children regardless of where they're living, but it, it kind of spurred me to start Foster Kinship 10 years ago because you'll see there's just deep inequity in our systems that mean that children in kinship care often can't access the same resources that other children can. So at Foster Kinship, it is our goal to make sure that kinship families have the information that they need to make the best decisions for their family. And we're also working to break down barriers so that regardless of where children are, they can thrive. And we know that most children who can't live with their parents stay with their family in loving kinship homes. And we believe that those homes deserve to be supported just like any other foster home is. So a little bit about um, Foster Kinship's program. We are primarily providing case management services through our Navigator program, making sure that families have access to basic needs, that they're able to connect to legal support that is appropriate for their family, whether it be a guardianship or adoption or foster care licensing, um, depending on if the child is in or out of foster care. And then we want them to access financial support so that the family can thrive. And then we do a lot of training and support the grandparents and other relatives to make sure that they are providing nurturing care, that they understand potentially the trauma, abuse, and neglect that the children in their home have gone through, um, and that they're able to get support from each other. And the foundation of our program has always been the voices of the families that we serve. And we want to make sure that as we grow, we're always listening to our families and providing what they're asking for. So when COVID hit six months ago, um, I was up all night the first night just thinking about if something happens to our caregivers, what is gonna happen to our children? And like most things, um, our systems are designed for parents and not necessarily for grand families and kinship families. And so these families who are underserved in the best of times, um, were really going to be disproportionately affected again by the pandemic. So foster kinship did a few things to make sure that our caregivers could stay as safe as possible. Um, we partnered with several organizations that were new to us to make sure that families had support. So we were getting meals delivered to families. We were delivering basic items like diapers and Lysol wipes in the beginning. Um, we made sure that families who needed financial support, we accessed a, some, some money where we're just getting cash in the hands of family. Um, and then we started working on modifying our program to make sure that all families could continue to receive our services remotely. Um, as school started back up again for us, um, it's remote here and it's a big challenge technology wise. And we were hearing just a ton of frustration from families just not able to teach and care for their children and go to work. And if you're a single grandmother or great grandmother, you are in an impossible situation. So we reached out and we received some CARES Act funding to provide child care support to our families um, to make sure that they can get their kids in maybe a hybrid learning program so that the school can happen, kids are safely watched and caregivers can continue with their work life and keep their families stable. Finally, we're offering respite care um, for our families just to give them that break. Um, but we know that what we're doing is not enough and it's not enough anywhere. And so if I could say anything, it's just to advocate for more support for kinship families, for kinship navigator programs. And like I said, we serve 33,000 of these children is our goal in our state, but that is less than 2% of all the children in kinship care in the United States. So we need to remember Gail's story and, and amplify that for all the children in kinship care. And I just thank you very much for this opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Allie. And I think Gail nailed it when she said we need more Allies around the country. We also need more Gails. We need more of all of you. Um, thank you all for everything that you do. 
uh, I'm now honored to introduce you to another Gail and Allie, um, which is uh, Victoria Gray, who's another member of Generations United's Grand Voices Network. Her and her family live in Arizona, and she is also the founder of Gray Nickel Inc., which helps grandfamilies like hers. Uh, Victoria um, has joined us today to share her family's story, and we're so grateful you're with us, Victoria. I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's exciting when we get to share our stories to make a difference in the lives of kinship families. My husband and I started this journey in 1993 with a granddaughter that was born with a medically fragile. The term kinship, grandfamilies, those terms didn't exist then. But we took in our granddaughter. Uh, she had a brother that was born that was not biologically uh, linked to us and we took him in. Uh, in order to keep him, we had to become a foster parent. Then we fostered 41 children. When my daughter got into trouble and we were given her five children. So our family went to a, a family of nine overnight. And it was really hard. Every year we kind of struggled with new things and new things. But COVID brought an entirely different uh, twist on our lives and our discipline and our structure in our home. It started with my sister having a stroke on vacation in Las Vegas, and I was her medical power of attorney. So I had le left my family to travel there to make sure she was cared for, came back home, got my stuff together, went back there only to find out that the hospitals were closed and would not allow any other uh, people to come in to see patients. So then I was back home. I'm traveling home to find out that they were on their last roll of toilet paper. So it was a stop in all kind of little towels to see if we could find uh, toilet paper. I get back home and the school was closing and we didn't have a computer that the children could use. And so that was very rough because I wanted them to stay on top of what their school schooling was uh, so that they didn't fall behind. Coming back home and then trying to get food was almost impossible. So we had gone to the store and there was nothing on the shelves and then they decided that they would do a program just for 65 and older that we could go in at five or six in the morning. But we did that only to find out that the trucks were there, but they didn't have anyone to unload them to restock the shelves. So even though we were given that chance to go in early and to be able to avoid people that were younger or that may be able to transmit to us because we both have underlying medical conditions, it was not beneficial because the shelves still were not stocked. The things that we could find they had raised the prices on. So our food bill increased. My daughter, my granddaughter, who was an essential worker was able to work, but her daycare closed. So she brought her three children, a one, two and a four year old to my house. I was already still raising out of the seven grandchildren, a set of twins, 15, who turned 16 in February, and a set of twins, 17, who turned 18 in April. So she brought the kids to me because she had no choice. She could not continue to work if the daycare was closed. So that added increase to our food and it added increase to our water bill, our electric bill. There was just so much going on. She was struggling and I couldn't turn my back on her. Um, the children's father died in a domestic violence incident just the year before as he tried to help and he got murdered. So she was already in distress. COVID had come. She was going to lose her job. So we took the children in that added the increase to our family. It just made it so hard. Not only was the COVID affecting me and my husband as we tried to raise our grandchildren, but now our grandchildren were also being, uh, having the effects of COVID. My 23 year old grandson who had moved out, had his own place, he got laid off, but he came back to my house. He says, Nana, I have to be in a safe place. So he came in. It's 
good to know that he felt that my house was safe and that he could come, but it was adding more and more to the household. Uh, the injustice happened and it was a totally different atmosphere in our household because for African Americans, we have this discussion all the time about safety, how to act when they're out in public with the police. And so these things were going on. And now the children were like, we can't go out. And now all of these things are happening. So it's a big challenge this year. In addition, they decided that they were going to open the schools. Well, we were having an increase of child COVID here in, in Arizona. So now on top of all of the other things, you had to decide whether you wanted to send your children to school knowing that there was a children's virus that was going around. So we had to deal with that. 2020 has been really rough. There's the weather going on. There's fires on the California side. There's floodings and tornadoes on the East Coast. And I have family members on both areas. So we were dealing with that on top of scammers, and solicitors who knew people were quarantined, your phone rings constantly, nonstop, trying to figure out if you need help paying your bills, do you want to sell your house? And it just goes on and on. And so you're dealing from one roller coaster ride to another. What's going to come next? How am I going to get through? And as you set a schedule and make plans for day to day, COVID changes and the things that you were assured of the next day was out because now COVID said, well, we're going to change this. Excuse me. We're going to change this and we're going to change that. So that all the plans that you had changes once again. So on top of everything else, I had someone call me and say, if you could vote today, who would you vote for? And I'm like, really? That's not on my plan right now. I don't know why you're calling to ask me that. Can you call me and tell me where we can get food and how we can do? It, it's just amazing that COVID hit and in 2020, it's been a roller coaster ride from month to month to week to week, things change. And as uh, we do as kinship caregivers, we're struggling with the children in home. They've got medical issues. They've got behavior issues. As a kinship caregiver, when we're talking about health and mentally for the children, caregivers also need some support. It just makes sense that you would help support the caregiver because they are the caregivers for the children. And if we can't keep us ourselves strong, we can't provide that strength for our children. So as COVID continues and as we reach to the end of the year, we look around to support each other. I have a nonprofit and I work with kinship families all the time, helping with resources, support for them. And the biggest thing that I do is let them talk. So many families say no one wants to hear my story. They come in with a checklist, you know, this, check that. But sometimes give us a chance to tell our story. We need you to listen because we want to be able to tell you what we need and not you decide what we need. I can tell you more about what I need than you provide what you think I need. So hearing us is very important. I thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Ms. Victoria, for that powerful story and most importantly for the important work that you are doing um, for other families like yours in Arizona. Thank you. I'm Jaya peterson Lent. I'm the Deputy Executive Director at Generations United and I will be facilitating the question and answer portion of the program. Um, so if you have a question and have not already dropped it into the Q&A function in the Zoom, um, please do so and I will be taking the questions now. So I'm going to start with a question and if our if our speakers, our um, panelists could turn your your screen back on, Gail and Victoria, wonderful. Um, then we will, I'll direct a question um, at you if it's, if it's directed to you. 
So um, while we're getting settled, I'll just so the questions that have been coming into the chat that we did respond to, but I want to flag for everyone is, yes, this is being recorded, um, and the slides as well as the recording will be posted to the website along with the report, and you'll be getting a, that link to the report um, at the end of this presentation, so you can download that and have access to all of that information. So the first question I'm going to direct to Gail and Victoria. Um, Gail, if you'll respond first, and that is, um, what would be the most helpful support or service, you can name a few, to you and families like yours right now? The thing that I could use the most would be a mentor for my grandson. My struggles every day of trying to be 24-7 for a little boy with disabilities, um, being his school teacher is a challenge. I don't have any respite at all. So having someone with younger legs to take him out to do those good things with him would be the best gift anybody could ever give me. And I have not been able to find one in 13 years. Thank you, Gail. Victoria? I think the biggest thing is, and, and I tell all the families this, that it's really hard to ask for what we don't know we need. And every day there's a new need and we don't understand. Sometimes we're trying to figure out things and we don't know where to go, who to contact, but it's something new that we didn't know that we needed yesterday. And so it's, it's kind of hard. For me, I would say, if you could just let us tell our story so that you know where we stand, how we stand, we can tell you what we need. We just don't know if, the, if that is out there. And so I can tell you what's going on and someone can say, oh, wow, I know someone who could take care of that. I know some agency that can help you with that. But to come in with a checklist doesn't give me a chance to express where I am, how I'm feeling, and what's going on. And even though it may be a need, I might not know that that need can be fixed without letting you know where I am. So important. Uh -huh. um, listening, listening. Thank you, Victoria. The next question uh, I'll direct to Ali Cayendo. And the question is, um, Ali, how does your program offer safe respite and child care during the pandemic? So we run our respite care on site out of our kinship resource center. So first of all, all of our staff are background checked. They're trained in trauma. Um, right now, what we're doing is we're only serving one family at a time. So we're not sort of mix and mingling children from different families just to make sure that um, we're not potentially spreading anything. And then of course, we're making sure that we're following all the guidance from the CDC and the health district to make sure that we're keeping kids and families in temperature checks and masks and vigorous washing. In terms of child, we're providing subsidy for caregivers to choose the location that's best for them. So if they're making a decision for their family that they want to go to the YMCA, which is offering a hybrid education childcare model right now, and they trust the YMCA's procedure, we're allowing um, them to choose that and we're paying for it. So it's a family decision, um, but all of our childcare um, locations are also citing recommendations for COVID. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you, Ali. Great. Um, the next question, I'll just give a heads up in case we have some of the researchers from GROW that worked on the survey with us. Um, you could feel free to type an answer to this in the chat if you have it. Um, we have a question about, were you able to gather any data on what type of food pickup sites the families were going to when they discovered that they ran out of food? Um, and I'm not sure, Anna, if you have a response to that. I'm not sure we have that detailed level of information uh, about food pickup. Um, we've certainly heard this anecdotally from um, families that have gone to wait in foods for the school lunches, um, food banks, other systems. I don't know if um, any, any of our speakers have a response to that from an anecdotal place, um, but we can, well, we're happy to provide um, 
the quantitative answer if we have it. I'm not sure we do. Well, Carrie said what I believed was what, what, what I thought was was accurate was that um, we don't have any additional nuance on that piece of information. Carrie Little, Dr. Carrie Little, what is one of the researchers who did that survey in the chat box? Thank you, Carrie. Anyone else can speak to issues related to running out of food, Allie? So we noticed that the um, things that were set up for families, especially initially, were not sufficient to keep grand families safe. We're requiring families to leave the house every day to go to school site pickups, wait in line, bring the kids. So we worked at Falconship pretty hard to turn around to make sure that families could have food delivered. There was alternate means of getting food to children so that they stay home and stay safe because it didn't make sense to increase the risk. Um, so I would say our response overall was sort of poor when we're thinking about protecting our grandparents and other relatives. Thank you, Allie. Another question we have is around whether there is any active legislation moving right now that would um, provide specific supports to help uh, kinship or grand families in response to the pandemic. Um, I'll flag a couple of things. Um, you heard Senator Brown uh, this morning mention the Child Welfare Emergency and Assistance Act as well as Karen Jones in introducing him. Um, he introduced that bill, um, which includes some, some investments in kinship navigator programs introduced in the Senate. There is also a bill in the House, uh, the Supporting Youth and Families Through the Pandemic Act, um, sponsored by, it's a bipartisan bill by Representative Davis and Representative Walorski. Also includes some investments in kinship navigators in a little bit of a, of a different way. We have more information about the details of that if you're interested in signing up for one of our alerts. Um, and then most recently, we have an update that um, the updated HEROES Act package that the majority in the House um, released last night does include um, the provisions from the davis Wolorski bill, that's the Supporting Youth and Families Through the Pandemic Act. So it does include provisions in that that would fund, provide additional funds for kinship navigators to help um, respond to issues related to the pandemic. So. Those are three pieces um, that are relevant in response to that question. Uh, answered my own question. So um, next we'll move to, um, we have a question for Anna. Is there specific state specific information in the report, Anna? So we, we elevate some anecdotes and we elevate the Nevada Foster Kinship Program. And then at the very end of the report, um, there is a one page table that has the numbers of children state by state in kinship foster care and in kinship care placements in general. So there's some data that's state by state at the very end as well. Great, thank you, Anna. And then we have a question for Victoria. Since you've experienced both being a kinship caregiver and a foster parent, what was the biggest difference in the type of support you received between the two types of caregiving? Uh, the going from a relative placement to a foster parent was very eye-opening, and I think that was one of the things that got me started on a mission to help other families. When I took in my granddaughter, this was in 1993, I think we got about $17 a month which was to help with her diapers. She was medically fragile. All of her medical and things were taken care of, but because of her illnesses, I had to stop working. When her brother was born, he was placed with us under the assumption that he was the same, that this, my son was his father also. But the DNA test proved that he was not biologically linked to us. And so we had to become foster parents in order to keep him with her. Once that happened, we got about $500 a month for him, but only $17 a month for his sister. At that point, I was trying to figure out what was the big difference. These are two children who are not in the care of either mom or dad. They both had medical issues, but yet one was valued at $17 a month simply because I was the grandmother and the other one was valued at $500 a month because he was with people that didn't know him, so to speak. So that started a journey of looking at things and trying to figure out why it was such a big difference. 
And from that point on, I started researching, looking at things and just trying to figure out how we can make a system work that is about the child, not about who has the child. If the child can go in foster care for $500, excuse me, then take a look at what grandma's got to do on a limited or fixed income. She still has to provide the same thing for that child that the other child is getting. Thank you, Victoria, <laughs> such an important point. Um, so I'm gonna group two questions together next, and I think I'll start with Anna, but anyone else is welcome to respond. Um, can you offer any opinion about why there appear to be more resources and programming in certain parts of the country or other parts of the country, Colorado, Arizona, others? Um, so that's one. And then perhaps a piece that could be related is also, are there any local and national sources currently that can support kinship caregivers during their with their challenges during the pandemic? Such an excellent question. And I think the bottom line is it comes down to people you know, like Gail and like Emily, who really um, start services in their communities. Um, you know, we have seen some states, state governments that do a better job supporting kin. Nobody does a perfect job. So it really is piecemeal around there and very much person driven. Um, in terms of resources, we have state fact sheets for each state in the country and they're available at grandfactsheets.org. And on those fact sheets, you can, uh, for example, in Virginia, see local programs um, that can assist with contact information. And then there's also a template of the federal programs and the local, the statewide contact um, information for those programs. So that's probably um, uh, the best resource to gather that information. And those fact sheets are free. So download them, disseminate them. We're in the process of updating them, but um, if you see something that's missing from your state, please let us know. Thank you, Jenna. Great, thank you, Anna. All right, and another question is about, um, can, a kin can federal kinship navigator funding be pulled down for a nonprofit kinship startup? Um, I'll direct that to Anna and then um, Allie or if others have feedback. So the Federal Kinship Navigator Funds, which we've had now um, th three years in a row, or is it four years, Jaya? Anyway, many years in a row, <laughs> three. Um, I lose a little track of time. Um, it goes to the state child welfare agencies to develop, enhance, or um, evaluate their kinship navigator programs. And that program, that money's been available. Almost every state's gotten it. Almost every tribe has gotten it, every territory. Um, so that money's out there. And the um, state, state child welfare agencies and tribal child welfare agencies and territory child welfare agencies are really encouraged and required actually to collaborate with nonprofits who have trust built up with the, navig with the kinship navigators programs like Foster Kinship, which runs it for the state of Alabama, the state of Nevada. And Ali, you get those, some of those federal funds, correct? Yeah, so definitely, um, and you should be a partner with your state. Thank you, Anna. And we do have a few more questions popping in. We'll take a look at them um, and try to share information through our various mechanisms if we didn't get to them. Um, but I wanna close with one last question. And that is that, um, and that's for all of you to just respond to very briefly. Um, and that is if there are people listening today that want to know what action they can take now to help grand families that are struggling during COVID-19. Um, what is your suggestion to them? And I'll go to, um, we'll start with maybe Allie, then um, Anna, then Gail and Victoria. Go ahead, Allie. Thank you. I think the most important thing is to learn more about the grand family's kinship in your area. Like Victoria said, listening is the most important thing, but also understand the scale at which children are not with their parents, but are in fact with family and the differences between what's available to them. So the more you know, the more you can help and advocate. Great, absolutely. And also um, we have an emergency fund at Generations United uh, set up to help grand families around the country that we've gotten support um, from and we've been able to disseminate laptops to various families, serve, um, 
uh, funding that's helped them pay for groceries, even something as simple as putting up, well, not so simple, but putting up a door in a house so people could have respite, so the caregiver could have respite. So know that there's a link to that fund in the report. Um, that's a way to help. Also just in your community, really, like Ali says. So um, there's, there's a lot we can all do. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Anna. Gail? Uh, yes, I, I uh, want to talk to you that Colorado has started working on a kinship navigator program. The important thing about that is that you are involving nonprofits around the state. The state cannot manage all of this. And so the important thing is to get nonprofits such as Allie's to be able to do it within their community. And those nonprofits know their families and listen to their families. And like Victoria says, listen to us. We are the ones who are living this. We know what we need. Please listen to what our stories have to tell you. Thank you. And Victoria. Oh, thank you so much. There's a lot of different organizations and things that can help. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. And so it makes it hard when we have a need that we can't reach the people who have what we need. So more of resources that we know where they are. We, I, I was a benef beneficiary of one of the laptops, which for teenagers in the house was so great and we were able to get food. But even with food, we had to split up in order to get the things that we needed. Uh, I wanted to mention that when you were talking about food, but I would go to one store, my husband went to another store, my granddaughter went to even a third store, and out of the three, we were able to get toilet paper from one, milk from another one, and bread from another, because you go to one store, they didn't have it, but that was the way that we had to do it. Um, we find a way to do it, but we just need to know who's out there who's listened to our story and can provide the things that we really, really need. Thank you to all. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that we do also have an election coming up. Um, and I know that it's an overwhelming question, but we do have the power of the vote. Um, so just want to acknowledge that that is another um, way you can have an impact. Become familiar with what your legislators um, believe and stand for and um, raise your voice in that way. So we're going to um, end now. Uh, thank you for this rich discussion and such important questions. Um, I wanna wrap up by giving just a special thank you to our speakers, a special, especially to Ali um, Caliendo and all of the work that you do with your team at Foster Kinship. A special thank you to Ms. Gail Engel and Ms. Victoria Gray for your powerful stories, but most importantly, for the care that you provide for your grandchildren. COVID-19 has brought to light the many strengths and challenges that grand families face. We must all recommit ourselves to the fight for recognition, respect, and resources that children and caregivers and grand families deserve. Near the beginning of the pandemic, a grandparent reached out to us concerned. She said, I don't think grand families are being considered. It seems like we're brushed over. It's like, we know you exist, but we don't really know what we need to do to support you. That caregiver was Miss Gail Engel, who you have heard from today. Gail, Victoria, and to all the caregivers out there, it is our sincere hope that this report will lay a clear path for action and the next steps in our journey together to create a nation that helps grand families thrive even in the midst of the pandemic. On your screen, you'll see a link to where you can access the report. And we will also post the recording and the slides from this event. We invite you to view and share the report and use it as a tool to raise your grand voices for grand families. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>